Hello, welcome to another of our sessions of digital slide review and surgical pathology. I'm Dr. Lewis Hassel, and I'm coming to you from the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center, part of OU Health. And our program is part of the Digital Anatomic Pathology Academy. It's a joint venture between the Digital Pathology Association and PATH Presenter. Uh, our program today is going to talk a little bit about uh, infertility and part of the uh, intersection sometimes between surgical pathology and uh, parasitology. <clears throat> the patient is a, uh, uh, a woman with uh, apparent infertility. Uh, her ethnic background uh, indicates that uh, she has immigrated from a developing country um, as a, a young, uh, young adult um, and has married and is now uh, anxious to have children but uh, appears to be unable to do so. Uh, investigation leads to uh, undercovering some uh, dilatation of her fallopian tubes, sort of hydrosalpic sort of thing. And so in an effort to uh, uh, potentially surgically uh, improve her chances at fertility, a uh, uh, tubal uh, uh, surgery is employed to uh, potentially correct some of the issues. So uh, in that process, uh, it's important to think about uh, what may be a cause of infertility, first of all. Uh, of course, this can arise at any level uh, in the uh, uh, whole uh, axis of uh, fertilization and reproduction that can begin with the CNS, uh, can involve the uh, ovaries themselves in the form of polycystic ovarian disease. Uh, it can involve the tube in terms of the transit of the uh, 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 embryo and uh, of course the endometrium uh, where things can interact to Im uh, impair or impede implantation and so forth. And of course, even beyond that, there are genetic disorders and so forth that can enter into the possibilities there. Although usually those present with uh, more like uh, you know, recurrent abortion and that sort of uh, situation. So I mentioned that in our case, this was a tubal issue. Um, and uh, here are uh, representative sections from a portion of the, the fallopian tube, which was dilated and uh, removed. Uh, so uh, rather than just scanning at low magnification and uh, brushing this off as another case of hydrosalpinx, uh, we noticed that there's just a little bit of busyness to this uh, uh, mucosa. And so we'll come in here a little bit uh, higher magnification. Uh, and as we look here, we can see that uh, apologizing for the uh, rather dirty slide, uh, we can see that uh, there's uh, these little uh, ovoid to slightly spherical bodies uh, that have some sort of uh, material inside. Um, and uh, as we look around, there's quite a few of these. Occasionally, we see a little hint of a sort of a side indentation in some of these. Um, and they seem to be involving the mucosa, the small vessels, um, and so forth here, and provoking a little bit, not too much uh, response, but some, some uh, fibrosis perhaps in some areas. Um, and we don't always see the full uh, interior structure of these, uh, but we do uh, appreciate that there is a bit of a sort of a, a firm cuticle to the outer portion of this. So this very much looks like uh, an egg uh, type of structure. Uh, as we see here, a little bit of internal structure and this nice uh, cuticle, a very re firm refractile uh, material. So uh, this is about the size that we would expect uh, from uh, schistosomal uh, eggs. Uh, and uh, that uh, makes it likely that the schistosomiasis uh, may be responsible for uh, this woman's uh, hydrosalpinx and hence infertility. So how do these uh, uh, organisms get there? Well, uh, making the diagnosis of schistosomiasis certainly should raise the question of, you know, where did this patient get exposed and how are we going to make the diagnosis? Uh, so first of all, finding a person who has the right social background, exposure history, and so forth. Uh, then the more simple way is that usually the eggs are secreted or exit uh, through the stool. Um, and so direct smears of the stool or concentration techniques, sometimes they come out in urine, uh, 
where either direct or concentration techniques can be uh, used. And more recently, we have developed some circulating DNA tests that potentially allow us to detect this um, as a, a sort of shed DNA from the actual worms themselves. Uh, imaging has relatively limited role to play in diagnosis. Uh, usually it can be used in staging or follow-up to detect areas of involvement, but as a primary means of diagnosis, it's very limited. Serology uh, likewise can be used in some cases, the ELISA tests and Western blot um, and uh, so forth. And then finally, endoscopic, endoscopic exam, cystoscopic exam, plus or minus biopsy is not infrequently the manner in which this comes to a diagnostic affirmation. Uh, in terms of the schistosomal organisms, they can uh, uh, be present uh, either in the form that we saw in the tube, or you can actually find evidence in some systems, uh, particularly in areas where they tend to have it, uh, inhabit, uh, of a direct um, inflammatory uh, response or even an epithelial response to the actual worm uh, itself. And so as we see here, uh, we've got several little foci of uh, rounded areas. These can be uh, associated with a lot of inflammation. And this is more the size of uh, some of the eggs in some areas here. Uh, but we also have these more larger microabscess changes here. This is, I think, from bladder mucosa. Um, and as you uh, pan around, you see evidence of the actual worm itself uh, in some of these areas. And here, for example, uh, several little areas where um, the uh, worm or uh, larvae have uh, uh, begun to uh, in encircle themselves in the soft tissue and in the uh, uh, vasculature uh, here. So uh, this sort of uh, a process is not a neoplasm. This is uh, evidence of the uh, worm itself uh, proliferating uh, in this uh, location. Uh, and here we can see some of the uh, inner, inner workings of uh, this uh, organism. So uh, a, a dense inflammatory response with a lot of uh, uh, filarial or roundworm type of structures can be also associated. Uh, now, uh, there's not morphologic features here that would be specific for um, schistosoma uh, worms, uh, but location, uh, dem demography of the patient, uh, and then coupling that with serology or other tests could be a confirmatory uh, of the inflammatory process. Now, uh, we'll refer back to this later, but you'll notice there's quite an interaction here with this inflammatory process and urothelial proliferation, which uh, is part of the risk profile in these patients uh, for subsequent diseases. So the bladder is uh, one location. Uh, here are some samples uh, taken endoscopically from uh, a uh, GI source, as you can see here, um, a, a colonic type mucosa with a submucosal sort of hyalinized uh, granuloma with a little bit of necrotic debris here. And I think you can again appreciate that we have uh, little egg-like structures here uh, entrapped uh, in this granuloma. Uh, not usually going to find the worm themselves here, but more likely the uh, uh, eggs, uh, as is, this is one of the roots of uh, exodus and shedding. So uh, depositing their eggs uh, in the uh, superficial vasculature or uh, other locations in the colon where uh, they may, through either ulceration or other means, uh, exit the body is how the organism uh, gains access to uh, reproduce and further its life cycle. Uh, finally, another location that uh, occasionally we encounter uh, is uh, the skin, uh, where um, in mucosal membranes and other surfaces like this, where the uh, uh, cuticle is not uh, dense and uh, highly protective, uh, the early myricidia or other uh, portion uh, larval stages of the uh, organism can enter uh, the body uh, in this fashion. Well, uh, in tribute to my uh, good friend, uh, KT, who's studying parasitology in her first year of medical school, uh, let me just review the life cycle of the uh, um, uh, schistosoma. 
there are three um, most frequently encountered uh, uh, types, Schistosoma mansoni, Schistosoma japonicum, Schistosoma hematobium. Uh, there is another uh, Schistosoma mekongi uh, that can also be encountered in Southeast Asia. Uh, each of these has relatively uh, limited um, uh, geographical extent, uh, but they are essentially distributed worldwide and with travel in these days, uh, this is uh, kind of uh, how, thing, how things work. So uh, let's begin with the uh, you know, egg stage and these get into the water source um, and then these eggs uh, hatch um, and little myricidia uh, are released, these little uh, almost single cell type organisms that then have to be uh, uh, taken into a uh, secondary or you know, kind of the, the first host, if you will, uh, a snail. Um, and the snails uh, are adapted for this and specific to the different geographies that are involved. Uh, but within the snail, uh, these develop to the next stage, which is forming a sporocyst, um, and then eventually being released uh, from that uh, to form cercaria uh, that are then free living. So then the human um, has some uh, exposure to this uh, infested water. Uh, either through wading, bathing, washing, etc. Um, and those uh, circacia uh, penetrate the skin. Now I've mentioned it's easiest through mucosal membranes, but occasionally in other locations that can happen as well. Um, and then during that penetration stage, they become schistosomuli. Uh, they gain access to the circulation and they migrate to, uh, through the liver uh, and mature into, a, a, into adults. They then would descend down the uh, vasculature uh, into more distant sites, um, into usually the mesenteric areas, uh, but some reach uh, the bladder, uh, especially uh, uh, schistosoma hematobium, uh, but uh, uh, mansoni, japonicum, and so forth, they, these can be uh, variably uh, encountered in other areas as well, because certainly some of the complications in the bladder are not uh, unique to uh, schistosoma hematobium. Uh, there is a sexual reproduction stage, so you have to have both uh, uh, forms of uh, mature adults uh, in order to produce eggs, uh, which uh, then come out in great abundance um, and through the processes that we've just described are released into the uh, uh, environment, uh, exiting through the urine or feces and so forth. So uh, where are these uh, likely to be encountered? Well, here's a little uh, map of the worldwide distribution of these uh, sorts of uh, disorders uh, with a little bit of uh, you know, risk uh, stratification, if you will, and uh, uh, particular types that are more likely to be encountered. Um, as you can see, the uh, uh, hepatic or intestinal types more frequently encountered uh, in uh, uh, Brazil, China, and portions of uh, uh, Southeast Asia. Um, the uh, uh, risk goes down in some areas here, but you may encounter others. Um, and uh, parts of Africa, um, and so forth, we can have uh, these uh, uh, other areas as well that where uh, there are both intestinal and urinary types uh, in broad zones of Africa and so forth. And of course, the distribution and reporting of these instances changes as people's exposure to natural water sources uh, is changed. And as uh, the, the uh, intermediate hosts, the snails and so forth are either controlled or uh, changed or dam damaged by other environmental in influences and so forth. So while this geographic distribution looks rare, very uh, uh, discouraging in other uh, circumstances, uh, it is uh, uh, actually fairly encouraging because it's not affecting all of these areas, but maybe fairly localized in certain uh, specific geographies. So uh, in terms of complications that are associated with schistosomiasis, it's uh, recognized that uh, uh, particularly those that involve the liver vessels that they can develop uh, liver damage and splenomegaly. Uh, we've seen some of the colonic changes that can be encountered, uh, bladder obstruction, inflammatory disease, as well as bladder cancers. Uh, 
Um, <clears throat> if the pulmonary vessels are involved, uh, you can develop pulmonary hypertension. And because these evoke an inflammatory response and may have some degree of uh, uh, inflammatory things, they, they can actually release or produce a septic-like uh, response. Uh, if there's uh, embolization through cardiac defect or otherwise, you can end up with uh, seizures. And of course, occasionally infertility as in our uh, incident patients. So uh, that's sort of a quick run through and summary. I just thought it uh, would be worthwhile to include this example of a, a bladder cancer. Uh, here in this case, that was uh, presenting in a patient uh, with a history of uh, schistosomiasis. Uh, just to remind us that uh, in this circumstance, you may not see the actual organisms here per se, but if we look over here, in fact, uh, we do see these long standing. Uh, very calcified and sort of uh, dead uh, schistosomal organisms. Now, uh, the association here uh, is uh, not uh, direct as a carcinogen, perhaps, but may be related to the inflammatory response, uh, <clears throat> producing a, a pro-inflammatory um, uh, uh, superoxides super or dismutases and so forth that can then lead to uh, epithelial chromosome uh, damage and the development of uh, malignancy. So that uh, brings us to the end of this real quick uh, summary. Uh, our diagnosis, uh, tubal schistosomiasis, uh, in this case, most likely secondary to schistosoma mansoni that was uh, uh, aberrantly distributed. Uh, we did see a little bit of a side hook there on some of those uh, eggs. Um, and uh, that was uh, the summary from our case. So I hope you enjoyed that uh, quick run through on schistosomiasis. Uh, it's certainly, uh, fortunately, not a uh, highly prevalent disease in much of the world where uh, uh, many of us work, uh, but uh, as international travel, as refugee circumstances alter population distributions and so forth, the odds of encountering uh, some of these less, inf less frequent uh, um, diseases uh, is certainly increasing and uh, we need to be aware of these possibilities. Thanks so much for joining us for this session. And if you like that, uh, please hit the, the like. Uh, and if you have comments or suggestions, uh, queries, uh, we welcome those uh, inputs as well, suggestions for future videos. Uh, and of course, we always uh, welcome new subscribers and are glad that you want to receive notification of new videos as they're released. So until next time, Thanks so much for joining me.